Corcoran Moore. I've had the pleasure of knowing her for a couple of years after she moved back here from Seattle, and she is um, has joined our chapter medical advisory board, and it's been great having her on and uh, having her help us organize this event for you guys. Um, after graduating from Emory University School of Medicine, Dr. Moore completed her internship and residency in, pe in pediatrics at the University of Colorado, right next door to this. Was it there then? Okay. <laughs> she then moved to Seattle to, for her fellowship in pediatric rheumatology at Seattle Children's Hospital, University of Washington, where her research focused on juvenile systemic sclerosis. Following her fellowship, she moved back to Colorado, because we love it here, and she's a big skier like me, uh, to join the pediatric rheumatology faculty at Children's Hospital Colorado and the University of Colorado. In addition to her clinical responsibilities, she is the site principal investigator for a number of clinical outcome studies in pediatric rheumatolo rheumatological illnesses. She also serves on the medical advisory board of the Colorado chapters of the Scleroderma Foundation and the Arthritis Foundation. Does that work? Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you guys for coming, and welcome to Colorado. I absolutely love it here, and I hope you guys have a short but amazing stay. Um, and Joanna, wherever you end up sitting down, that was, ama that was an amazing way to kick off, kick off this talk, or this whole day. Um, so I wanted to just give you guys a super, super brief kind of overview, and what I mean by brief, it's, I mean, still probably like 30 minutes, but scleroderma, there's so many different types of scleroderma, we could go on and on and on about it. So this is really meant to just be kind of a bird's eye view, and then later throughout the day, you'll hear much more detailed information about manifestations, approaches to treatment, current updates, and research. But this is kind of just an orientation, looking at the forest and not the trees. Um, and so to do that today, we'll talk a little bit about what does the whole concept of an autoimmune disease even mean? Because you'll hear this is an autoimmune disease, but we kind of just throw that word around. Um, a brief overview of the kind of the types of scleroderma, who gets scleroderma, and how we approach managing it, which is from a lot of angles. So scleroderma itself, so the little cartoon up there says it all sounds Greek to me, because it is. Um, it actually comes from Greek words for the sclero means hard and the derma means skin. And it is an autoimmune disease that we'll chat a little bit more about what that means in the next slide. But essentially, your immune system, the army that's supposed to protect you from getting sick for people with autoimmune disease, that kind of protective army turns against you. There's two basic kind of breakdowns in the kind of the tree of types of scleroderma, localized and systemic. They have some common features, namely they both share the word scleroderma, so hard skin is something you'll see in both of them, but they're also very two completely distinct entities that are, that are different that we will talk about. Um, so your immune system, even to kind of take a, a back step before we say autoimmune disease, we have to just say in a, in a regular healthy functioning person, how do you stay healthy? So this immune system that we all have is the cells going around through our blood. You kind of you hear of T cells and B cells. These are all types of cells that are there to help protect you against kind of foreign invaders, so to speak, against the viruses and the bacteria and the germs of the world. And the way that your body protects you against those things is you have these proteins in your body that are called immunoglobulins or antibodies. And antibodies are the part of your immune system that actually recognizes something that's not a part of you and says, hey, we need to get rid of that. That flu virus is not supposed to be in here. And you'll often, in kind of cartoon graphics, see antibodies depicted as these little, where's the pointer guy here? Like, oh, is that the pointer? The like Y-shaped guys there, and that just kind of gets to the chemical structure that they have. Um, but essentially what happens is they come along and they kind of recognize something's there that's not supposed to be, and they tag it as a little flag that then tells the rest of your immune system, we need to get rid of this thing. And one of the ways that your body helps get rid of viruses, bacteria, things that aren't supposed to be there is by triggering a lot of inflammation and making it a really inhospitable environment for foreign things to hang out in. When you're trying to get rid of something bad, inflammation is good, 
but inflammation also can work against you. And that's kind of the heart of a lot of these illnesses is that inflammation process gets triggered and can cause damage. And so in autoimmune disease, kind of as the name implies, the auto meaning self, you are what I call an overachiever. So in addition to fighting off the bad stuff of the world, your immune system has a really fantastic gas pedal and a not so fantastic brake pedal. And it doesn't really know when to call it quits. And so in addition to fighting off the bad stuff, you also make antibodies that target your own body. Um, and then targeting things causes inflammation, inflammation causes badness. So an antibody, again, here's that little Y-shaped thing, again, sort of to the point of the way this works. So the little, this is a pediatric talk, hence overly cartoony. Um, so the little purple guy is supposed to be one of your immune system cells, something called a plasma cell. Those are the ones who actually make antibodies. And so in this case, they're going out to little green bacteria guys, and those antibodies are attaching to them. So then, then the big shark looking guy is another immune system cell that then is able to actually recognize things that have been tagged with these antibodies and kind of, like I said, gobble them up and make them go away. Great if you're trying to fight the flu or something else, not so great when it happens to yourself. And so an autoantibody, again, is an antibody that recognizes you instead of just something that's not supposed to be there. Sometimes in some illnesses, lupus in particular, but other conditions, um, the antibody attack itself, it really is as direct as it sounds, that the antibody is really responsible for kind of quote unquote gobbling something up. But to be honest, more often than not, it's, it's a little more indirect than that. And your immune system still is trying to protect you. And so these antibodies can actually form complexes with other parts of your immune system that can then go kind of lodge and get stuck in places, but that inflammation is still getting triggered, and that inflammation is what the problem is. Other times, we, don't, we haven't found a direct role that these antibodies play, but we just know in some illnesses they're there, which is why we still like to study them, because we hope that they may actually give us clues that, you know, hey, if you recognize this antibody pattern early on, maybe you're at a higher risk of progressing this way or responding that way, and that can actually help our treatment early on before you actually clinically get to a stage. So in illnesses like scleroderma in particular, it may not necessarily be that those antibodies are directly causing the damage, but they still are important clues that we like to study, and you're gonna hear more about that in some of the talks later today. Um, so scleroderma, in, in terms of kind of what's going on from that inflammation standpoint, is kind of hallmarked by two big processes. The first is fibrosis, which, which is just another way of saying scarring, and that is kind of a scarring that comes from inflammation. The cartoon graphic that's up there, that top layer, um, is kind of the top of your skin, so it's as if someone sort of took a cross section of your skin and kind of plopped it up there, so the very bottom is the muscle closest to the bone, the very top is kind of closer to the skin surface. And the sort of web-like area in between where there's collagen, that's one of the really important connective tissues in our body that help give it kind of form and substance. And if that layer is getting inflamed, it's gonna, oftentimes it kind of expands and gets puffy, and then eventually when that scarring can happen, it can sort of contract down and bound down and cause some hardening um, that you'll hear more about later. The blood vessel problems, which we call vasculopathy, so that the purple thing down there is as if you took a blood vessel, and again, you're kind of looking at it on cross sections. so the middle is the tube where the blood flows through, and the outside is the connective tissue that's around it. And almost if you can kind of imagine like using that top picture and like making a kind of pinwheel around it, this layer here is kind of that layer up there. So if there's thickness there, it can kind of squish in on the blood vessels and it can impact how much blood gets through. So especially with Raynaud's and you know, kind of blood flow to fingers, if you're squishing down those blood vessels, either from inflammation or scarring, it can result in less blood flow. But the biggest question is, you know, and Joanna alluded to this too, I think the, the human question is, but why? Why, on an emotional level, you know, why me? Why not my best friend? Where did I go left when everyone else went right? Why is this happening? And then why from the more kind of cerebral angle of scientifically, why is this happening? And right now, you know, the answer is not straightforward and we think at the end of the day, it's a combination of several different things. 
there seems to be genetic risk behind autoimmune disease in general, not always genetic that, you know, grandma's got it, so mom's got it, so child's got it, but there are certain genes that you'll hear more about later today that may predispose to risk. There may be environmental factors, hormonal factors, you know, hormones come up a lot because of sex differences in terms of how many girls versus boys get autoimmune illnesses. At the end of the day, all of these factors kind of lead to just dysregulation in your immune system, those inflammatory signals that are triggering the process of inflammation, and then ultimately kind of changes in the connective tissues in your body that lead to the changes that you kind of see on the skin's surface. The most important thing that I just want to absolutely underscore is that it's not fair and it is not your fault. It is not something that you did that you should not have done. It's not something that you didn't do that you should have done. It's, it just stinks. Um, and we're getting more and more information to know how to better treat these things. But again, not anybody's fault. Super, super brief overview in terms of the types of scleroderma. So the first branching point, the two green boxes, is the localized and the systemic. Um, you'll hear again more about each of these later. Under localized, we then, just because we're doctors and we're nerds, we like to give like lots of classifications and lots of different names and kind of make things sound more complicated than they have to be. So we, even within localized, have lots of different categories um, and different subtypes. Morphia, linear scleroderma are probably the two most common. The um, incudisab is essentially linear scleroderma that can happen on the face. Um, and it kind of means that, you know, the, the touch of the saber, the touch of the sword is where the origins came from. Um, under the systemic form, limited and diffuse are essentially just distinguished by what kind of body surface part. The little graphic there is kind of the white area versus the purple area. That's just kind of how we break it down. Um, the other thing, though, and Joanna was alluding to lupus and Raynaud's and scleroderma, in pediatrics in particular, they also see this in adults, but we in particular see a lot of what we call overlap syndromes, meaning that you have some features of one autoimmune illness, like say scleroderma, but you may also meet criteria for another autoimmune illness, for example, lupus or myositis, which is muscle inflammation. And so sometimes you get kind of more than just one thing. But I think the most important thing on this slide is that localized does not become systemic. Um, as a general rule of thumb, these are two different entities. Granted, when systemic sclerosis is first presenting, if it were to present in just one area, initially it may, there may be confusion. But it really, by the time it declares itself, we do consider these to be two different things. Um, super quick slides. I'm not going to go into detail because you're going to hear more about this later. But in localized scleroderma, that's in, for children in particular, they localized is much more common than systemic. The skin involvement, it's usually unilateral, but it doesn't have to be. Oftentimes, they are discrete lesions. And what I mean by that is you can kind of draw a line around the area that is wrong as opposed to the systemic form that is much more generalized throughout your body. And it's not just limited to the skin, though. I think that's an important thing, too. And part of that is because inflammation can go deeper than what we just see on the skin surface. If you know, inflammation goes down to your tendons and to you know, muscle area, you can have contractures. It can impact kind of the growth of particular parts of the body. It can make some limbs shorter than others. Um, if people have it on their face, there can be a lot of dental associated problems, a lot of other problems related to how it's impacting the tissues underneath. And we diagnose it largely based on what things look like um, and kind of getting a history. I think the history and the exam are the most important things. Sometimes we do need biopsy to be sure it's not something else. And then labs are not, there's no one lab that we can get that that particular blood test says you have scleroderma. A lot of the labs are to rule other things out. And then we, you know, you'll hear more about these antibody studies and other things that may help us kind of predict outcomes and you know, monitoring kidney function, liver function, blood cell counts, especially if you're on medications to keep you healthy. But there's not one single blood test that says this is scleroderma or it's not. Um, for systemic sclerosis, much as the word systemic implies, much more widespread and, um, and multi-system. And the inflammation is not just in an area that you can kind of draw a line around, but is much more throughout the body. 
and treatments, you'll hear more about research, but I think what we kind of just to underscore the need for it is that the treatments that we have largely are based on the studies in adult patients that we then extrapolate to pediatrics, which is fraught with its own issues because kids are not one of the kind of sayings that we have in pediatrics is that kids are not just little adults, and it's true, they're not. They handle medications differently. They have different things going on. Um, I do often counter that by saying adults are just big babies, but um, kids are not little adults. <laughs> In, um, in systemic disease, you know, a list here of like literally every organ in the body, it doesn't mean that you are destined to have every organ in your body take a hit from it. It just means that it's a potential and these are things that we need to monitor for. And sometimes just simply, you know, the fatigue and the going about your day to day business, that can be just as debilitating as any of the specific manifestations. Um, from the treatment standpoint, again, stay tuned for other talks later today, but I think the general concepts are general support for your body in addition to medications and the kind of pharmacologic approaches, you know, staying warm. Um, with Raynaud's in particular, one thing is that a lot of the temperature sensors in our body are located actually around our most important organs, like our heart and our lungs. So it's really easy if you have bad circulation to remember great gloves and great socks, but you also need to remember to keep your core warm as well. Um, Joanna was also referring to support for the soul, which is equally important. Um, you know, support groups, meetings like this. The Arthritis Foundation does summer camps, and just because the name is Arthritis Foundation, essentially, at least here in Colorado, and I guess my assumption is this is true in other places too, they, they kind of treat it as rheumatology camp for kids. Um, and physical and occupational therapy and rehab, you guys are going to hear some great talks later today from that standpoint for regaining function. Um, and then there is medication to help with inflammation. I think the other important piece, though, is that it's not just a matter of treating the problems that we can see, but actually being on the lookout for problems that we can't see from the outside before they may become bigger problems. And so often with systemic disease, with, at baseline, we want to kind of get good pictures of the lungs. So a CT scan really helps us look kind of at the architecture of the lungs. This girl here is doing what we call pulmonary function tests, or PFTs, where you breathe in and out of a hose, and it kind of measures how much force your lungs have. And that gives us information about how strong your lungs are. We do echocardiograms, which are an ultrasound of the heart to make sure that your heart's pumping normally. And then um, the upper GI small bowel follow through is what that stands for. And that's a way of essentially you swallow this liquid that they will lie to you and say is a vanilla milkshake. It does not taste like a vanilla milkshake. Um, it's very chalky and not so pleasant tasting, but it is very helpful to you swallow it. They take pictures as it goes through your intestinal tract and it kind of looks at how your intestine is squeezing um, in terms of motility and stuff getting through. So who gets this? Um, so the words, so just as a kind of definition, the word prevalence, that refers to at one particular kind of point in time, if you were to look across the country or look across the world, how many people have this disease now? And in localized scleroderma, it's about 50 per 100,000. Um, there is some ethnicity breakdown there with the majority of um, folks who get localized scleroderma being Caucasian, but that does not mean it does not happen to all races and all ethnicities. Um, it is primarily a disease of younger aged kids as opposed to adult onset. Um, and females, in terms of the numbers and the studies, females get it more often than boys do. For systemic disease, it's about half that in terms of prevalence. It's even more uncommon. Um, in kids, at least the, some of the studies that we've done that have looked across the board, we haven't kind of found the same ethnic breakdown as, they, um, as we do in other illnesses. Again, the average age of onset for systemic disease is actually different. That's more of an adult onset disease, but definitely kids get it too. Um, estimates are about 3% of the adults out there who have systemic sclerosis, it started in childhood. Um, interestingly, under, the age, under a certain age, so for younger kids, the male to female seems to be a little bit more equal, um, which I think just kind of gets to genetic risk factors, immune system dysregulation, things that kind of put you at risk at baseline would be more likely to come out at a younger age um, than people who have it start when they're older. 
In terms of kids versus adults, I don't know if any of you guys are planning to stay for the education day tomorrow, which is on the same campus, but like across the courtyard that way, um, which is the adult scleroderma education day. Um, but I think, you know, so I won't go into big detail, but the, two, the things just to take home, linear scleroderma, more common than systemic in kids. Um, and in terms of prognosis, I think there's also different, you know, like I said, we extrapolate some data from the adult population, but kids are not little adults. You can't say that enough. You know, kids metabolize medications often better. They have young, healthy liver and kidneys and oftentimes can actually respond better um, than adults with some things and maybe some therapies that work great for adults don't work the same way in children. Um, Kids in particular and teenagers, there's, in addition to the medical piece of it, a huge piece of developmental and emotional and why am I not like my friends and why can't I just go kick the soccer ball the same way everybody else can if my foot doesn't you know, kind of kick and move the way that I want it to. And we all know, everyone here remembers being a kid, like kids could be darn right mean. Um, some kids are amazing, but some friends are not. Um, and there's that added aspect when you're at an age where all you want to do in the universe is be just like everybody else. And being unique and being an individual sound all great when you're older, but when you're a kid, that's like the last thing in the universe that you want. And so I think you know there's these implications that are kind of go more than skin deep, no pun really intended. <laughs> Um, in terms of the cumulative damage, too, I think that also, you know, the younger you start, the longer you've had inflammation, the longer you're on medications for by the time you get into adulthood, and so things can also build up over time and take a toll. I think regardless of type, though, the things that kind of underscore whether this is localized or systemic is that these are chronic processes. And the treatment's individualized. It's not that you just get you know, a diagnosis and regardless of anything, this is your drug. It's going to be, is this localized? Is this systemic? What part of your body is, is impacted? And all of those things kind of go into deciding the best plan for any one patient with the overall goal of how can we minimize the impact of this disease on your life and how can we improve your function? And how can we control inflammation? Because we do a lot better job controlling inflammation than controlling scarring. And the biggest thing is the need for research, which you guys will hear a lot more about later today. Um, from the research standpoint, just one of the things that to, to point out, and I think you'll hear again more later today, but there is this organization called CARA, where essentially to better help us study rare illnesses that don't happen all that much, rather than one individual center saying, hey, I'm gonna look at all of our scleroderma patients, since that may only be you know, a handful or a few handfuls of patients, uh, rheumatology centers across North America came together and said, hey, let's try to pool our data and be able to study this from a much larger scale and study you know, hundreds if not thousands of patients as opposed to tens or twenties or thirties of patients. Um, and that's, you'll hear more about Kara and the studies coming up. Um, so some take home points. Scleroderma is autoimmune disease, dysregulation of your immune system, not your fault. We're having some ongoing research into its cause, likely multifactorial, localized and systemic, some common features, namely the hardening of skin, but where that happens and what other manifestations you have, localized and systemic still are two different illnesses. Um, and for treatment and research, stay tuned. Questions though, or comments? Yeah. So there are definitely, and I think you guys do talk about genetics, right? Some do it, right? Yep. So you'll hear more about that later, but bottom line is yes. Um, and oftentimes what we'll see is instead of being kind of the same, you know, like, again, like, you know, the example, grandma's got one, you know, say lupus, and then mom's got lupus and child's got lupus. More often than, there are some rare cases where that does happen, but more often than not, what we see is that some families just have a much more generous salt and peppering of autoimmune diseases of various types than others. So it may be more, you know, this grandma's got thyroid disease and that person has, you know, lupus and that person has rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's and kind of see kind of a scattering. And then you have other families that have no family history 
And you have other families where it's loaded family history, but then the kids are completely healthy. So there definitely are, is some genetic component that um, not only will you hear more about later today, but we also, there's ongoing research into that too, because it's really important. Yeah. So my question is, although I've, we know and we've been told that localized and systemic do not go together, why is it then that somebody that has juvenile linear scleroderma will have like the Raynaud's phenomenon and other symptoms of the systemic that I'm just baffled that it makes zero sense to me? It's a great question. And I think part of it is that rheumatology, honestly, in general, is baffling sometimes. Um, you can get kind of a mix of different features of different illnesses. Some people can have, you know, just this, you know, the Raynaud's. But I think the, the Raynaud's in particular, because it really does kind of impact, get at that kind of the hardening of the blood vessels that are feeding those fingers. And so on the scleroderma spectrum, even if it's linear, and you're still kind of having scarring and fibrosis kind of in that part. What we can see on the surface is the skin, but that the skin is kind of a window into things that can be happening even deeper under the surface of the skin. And so namely kind of those blood vessels that kind of feed the end, feed kind of fingers and toes. Yeah. I'm sort of related to that regarding extracutaneous involvement. Um, I see a lot of um, parents online in Facebook discussions talking about, well, the dermatologist says we don't actually need to move to a rheumatologist right now because it appears to only be skin involvement, but then they're describing depressions and a lot of things that might lead one to suspect that there was extracutaneous involvement. And with the margin of error, you know, 20 to 70 percent, I'm just wondering what, how to respond to that. I would say there's nothing wrong with being an advocate and saying, hey, okay, that's great that you're saying that, but how about still seeing a rheumatologist just even for a look, so like you can even phrase it to them kind of for a more head-to-toe kind of approach of, of looking at things. That being said, you know, it also, there, there definitely are huge institutional variations in terms of how, how scleroderma, especially localized, is managed. There are some centers where, especially if it's a big academic center, where the dermatologists aren't just focusing on the skin and they're kind of in tune to other things and they feel comfortable enough with medications for them to be the ones kind of really driving the show. There's other institutions where they have combined rheumatology, dermatology clinics. So you see both a dermatologist and a rheumatologist in the same visit other places where rheumatology is primarily managing it, and it really is kind of based on that particular place and the expertise and the comfort level of the providers at that particular institution. Well, I, I don't want to keep things, I want to keep things, <laughs> I don't want to keep things delayed, but thank you guys. Um, and then a special thank you, um, obviously, Scleroderma Foundation for helping us with this. And then the names I put down here, Ann Stevens, you'll meet later. Mar Fritzler, he's a researcher in Canada who does a lot of our antibody testing um, and who is just an overall phenomenal guy. Dr. Torek is actually in with our teenagers right now, but she is, you'll hear more from her later too. Dr. Suzanne Lee you'll hear more from, and then not here today, uh, Brandy Stevens um, is also a physician who's done a lot of efforts looking into kind of these nationwide cohorts and studying scleroderma. Thanks guys.